The Enoughism podcast is about having enough already. In the words of renowned British therapist Marissa Peer, quote, you must say, I am enough constantly. Say it out loud. Say it with feeling. Say it like you mean it. And say it over and over again. And do so for weeks until it sinks in and replaces the feeling that you are not enough, which may be holding you back. End quote. It's this feeling that was one of the primary reasons I started the Enoughism podcast, which is about that feeling that we have inside ourselves about, am I enough? Do I have enough? Can I be enough? I learned about Marissa Peer from our guest today, Anne Muletower, host of the Out of the Clouds podcast, which is a really cool show about the intersection of mindfulness and business. Today, we're interviewing each other about mindfulness and meditation journeys, strategies to get through the pandemic, and what brings us joy. For more about the Enoughism podcast, visit IamEnoughism.com and follow me on social media at IamEnoughism. Hello and welcome to the Enoughism podcast. I'm Yugen Bond, a minimalist who wants more. I'm here with Anne Moltower from a podcast called Out of the Clouds. Anne, you are a fashion executive turned meditation teacher living at the crossroads of business and mindfulness. Welcome. And how has this experience helped you grow and better serve the meditation community? So thanks for having me first. Thank you so much for this intro. That's a good question. I am just at the start of my journey as a meditation teacher. I am just about to finish and graduate with the MMTCP, which is a bit of a mouthful, Mindfulness and Meditation Teacher Training Program with Tara Brack and Jack Cornfield. So at this point in time, the community that I'm serving is mostly a business community that wants to get into meditation and mindfulness. And thankfully, because I spent around 20 years working in and around retail, PR, wholesale, and then getting into communications, uh, global comms, etc., I have significant expertise or experience in managing teams and also communications in general. The <laughs> I like to say the good, the bad, and the <laughs> ugly, the stuff that works and the stuff that doesn't work. And, um, and so it is an interesting exploration for me to actually bring those two sides of my life that look like they should be far apart and finding a common ground and see how it could make things better for myself and everyone else. Yeah, and I think they're actually very closely related. I know many people, for example, with an entrepreneurial mindset might think, oh, meditation, mindfulness, that's way beyond the scope of what we do. This is business, this is hard skills. But there's a lot of analysis. I think soft skills are very much hard skills. I agree. Um, what is the typical business-minded person looking for when they want to expand their mindfulness experience and skill set? I, I can't speak for individuals because at this point in time, what I tend to do is I go to a corporation, a company, and I explain the benefits that meditation and mindfulness can have on people in general. And if that seems of interest to them, I offer them a six to eight week course to do introduction to meditation and mindfulness. And making this a curriculum, something that we can build upon on a weekly basis, gives everyone a chance to have a taster of the various practices available the one large misconception for people who are outside of meditation and mindfulness is that there's only one kind of meditation. And obviously, as you know, that's not the case. 
and not everybody's suited to the same thing. And yes. what works for me may not work at all for someone else. And as I started to teach, for example, what I noticed is, for example, restlessness could be very prominent in some people who are a lot more active, particularly there were a couple of students of mine who were um, athletes. And we found that it was much better for them to actually spend the hour and a half of our course for them to be standing for most of it. And standing meditation works as well as seated meditation. So working with individuals or companies and people who are interested in experiencing a panel of practices so that they can tap into what suits them over time. And then hopefully what I'm guessing that could happen is either they'll come back to me or they'll go and follow their instinct and go and try out other teachers and deepen their practice in, in that way. Yeah. So you're kind of like the springboard for the rest of their journey and even sitting versus standing, it's a very simple shift, but that can be enough to help people kind of get into the right mindset. I know your philosophy from listening to your podcast about meditation is that meditation is actually plural. It should be more about meditations. Talk a little bit about that. I find that very interesting. Sure. So I got into meditation completely randomly twice. <laughs> the, first, <laughs> the first time actually it was, I got a book after getting a recommendation from a friend of mine and she used to work with the founder of a big company called Netaporte. And Natalie Masne, who's an executive, who's very admired in the luxury and fashion business, who I worked with for a long time, credits this book for, and she's done that multiple times in, in, in interviews, and said that it supported her journey. And so I thought, if it's good enough for Natalie, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and I bought the book, and it's called Creative Visualization. And so my entry point into mindfulness and meditation was through Shakti Gawain and through that book. And there's a lot more um, visualizations indeed than simple meditations. And I picked it up here and there and played with it. And I thought that was fun and didn't think much more of it. And then later on, when I was on holiday in Thailand once, I just walked into a group class and I had no idea what the meditation was. It was called loving kindness. And then I, I did it. And at the end, the teacher said, imagine how powerful it would be if someone were to do that every day. And I thought yeah. to myself, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for six months, every day, I did 20 minutes to half an hour of metta meditation or loving kindness. Wow. Every um, day for six months. I cannot tell you why. You know how your brain sometimes plays tricks on you? It just, I guess it felt that, I don't know, it just, there was something to it. And last December, I went back to the same wellness center in Thailand and I attended Sujay's meditation on loving kindness. Obviously, he does not know, well, didn't at the time that I had done all of that, but he didn't know that started my journey in meditation and that I was becoming a teacher. And it was fascinating to sit back in that classroom, especially the bit at the end when he <laughs> told this much larger group of ours, it was maybe 50 people, that a woman came back to him and said that this practice had changed her life and that maybe she attended once four or five years ago. And I thought he was talking about me and it wasn't me at all. So just to say, loving kindness is a very transformational practice. So I didn't go in meditation through TM or transcendental meditation, although I have very, very close friends who absolutely swear by it. Yeah. I did play with um, Vedic meditation and mantra meditation. I also studied separately from my course, tantric meditation uh, with the amazing teacher, Sally Campton. And I, I find that there's different practices support different needs. Vipassana, which is insight meditation, that is the main Buddhist meditation that Jack and, and Tara teach in, in the course, is um, also transformational, but in other ways. And I think the reason why that suits 
I think a business setting or a corporate setting is that it actually promotes a lot of self-awareness and self-inquiry. And the better we know ourselves, the easier it is to relate to others, I think. And the better our relationship, the better our communication, the better our lives, right? Yeah. I think that one of the best things I've ever heard anyone say is you don't meditate to get good at meditation. You meditate to get good at life. So I kind of try to remember that <laughs> and not take myself I love that. Seriously. Yeah. I kind of had this mini realization while you were speaking. I'm, I think of kind of that fashion meditation intersection and you're talking about how there's so many different styles of meditation. And I, I start thinking about how there are so many different styles of clothing. And just <laughs> like you choose different articles of clothing to kind of represent your fashion sense and how you want to present yourself to the world. It's kind of like, in a way, you're trying to figure out what kind of meditation style works the best with your personality and where you are in your life to best present yourself to the world. Yeah, and it's finding something that meets your needs. But as we know, as human beings, we do evolve. And so I can tell you that my own practice during since the beginning of the pandemic, I've tried to follow my instinct and see what it is that I needed. And I focused a lot initially on mindfulness of breath. Breath is an entry point into our nervous system that depending on how deep or shallow we are and where we breathe from, it gives us a sense of, of how we feel, what state we're in. And so I, I decided to kind of check in on myself on a very basic primary level on a daily basis and just cover that and make sure that I knew my baseline. Because then the beauty of this is once, when something upsets you or upsets the balance, you're much more likely to be aware of it and to mindfully react to it or respond, I should say, rather than being reactive. But then later on in the summer, I just suddenly felt that I needed yoga nidra. I just needed to be lying down for all my meditations. And I even bought a weighted blanket great gift I gave myself, I have to say. <laughs> and, uh, and I did a lot of guided yoga nidra for, for about a month. And since September, I'm back to loving kindness every day, but generally with an introduction of mindfulness of breath or body first for, for, for 10 minutes or so. So it's interesting to see, we do have an instinct about how to lead our lives. So if we get a panel are four or five practices that are easy to tap into, then we get to, to choose what works depending on what's going on around us. Yes. Or in thank, us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you for sharing all of that. And one other thing I'm thinking about is um, you mentioned breath work and how important it is to breathe, something we do all the time, but we tend to forget that we're either not breathing correctly or that our our lack of breath is hindering our entire body and how we function and i'm, I'm sure there are times when maybe you realize oh i'm not breathing right <laughs> and do you find that things like breath work and, and yoga nidra when you really get into that flow that it's very instinctual and especially doing it every single day at the more you kind of work that muscle, the more you're able to tap into kind of that instinctual side where it's more innate versus something that you need like a spreadsheet and a checklist for to make sure you're doing it correctly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I interviewed the yoga teacher who led my teacher training last year because I became certified in Anusara Yoga um, in 2019. She put us through quite a lot of pranayama practice and indeed, I have to tell you, I didn't do that much pranayama before or even after I finished my teacher training. And I integrated it to my practice every day pretty much since April. I think I'm just at the tip of the understanding of what goes on with breath work. What I can share with you for sure is that there are two or three practices that like, for example, Nadi Shodana, which I've known for a few years that I love, which is alternate nostril breathing. Um, it can either energize you or calm you down, but both balance, let's say, the left or right side of the brain. 
and really deeply enhance your sense of grounding, your sense of calm, your sense of focus. So it's almost like, <laughs> I don't want to say it's a hack, but kind of, because if you know that if you do five minutes of breathing, it's going to make you super sharp before you start your day. And if you're writing, if you're working, if you're stepping into meeting rooms, whether on Zoom or in person, then it's kind of really worth exploring. So I'm spending more time with this and um, I'm looking forward to seeing what else I'm going to discover, to be honest with you. As for loving kindness or any of the other practices, for example, I think that all of these meditation practices that derive from the Buddhist lineages, so they all offer, I think, a lot of intimacy with ourselves right if you spend the time every morning even if it's five minutes and then you make it you know it becomes incremental over time spending time with yourself you just develop you know a, a deeper relationship you understand the content of your mind better even when it's full of stuff and it's jumping everywhere and loving kindness has this beautiful aspect that what we the, the mantras we use essentially relate to wishes that we can imagine are valid for everyone in humanity it's you know the common ground between all of us is our wish to be safe to be healthy to live with ease to feel loved connected so by doing this on a regular basis it just deepens our sense of relationship or relationality to others and I think it just opens up a lot of human connections or at least it has done for me yes I love your concept of meditation hacks <laughs> personally I I refer to them in my own mind as third eye touch points and it could be a moment even where I just I find a window wherever I am and I just kind of look up at the sky and just kind of watch the clouds and just remind myself, oh my gosh, this email that I'm looking at or this little piece of information that seems so trivial that is swirling around in my mind, it doesn't mean much and I am connected to everything. I went to this meditation class once that your stories reminded me of where someone talked about the different levels of meditation that you can achieve. So it's kind of like your mind is a house and you live on the ground floor where the furniture is and the dirty laundry is and uh, where the cat sleeps and the dirty dishes are. And then when you start meditating, you eventually live in the first floor of your mind where the bedroom with a nice view is and your library with your books are. And then when you start developing a practice, you're on the second floor where you have some skylights and you can see up into the universe. And then from there, you live on your roof and you can look up at the shooting stars and you kind of keep going and keep going. And the idea is that it never ends. Um, you used seven very powerful words at the beginning. You said, I'm at the start of my journey and it's interesting. Many people think that meditation is something that you can achieve. It's like you can, yes, I've done it. I've, I'm a meditation teacher, but it never ends. And you're always striving to expand your level of consciousness. Tell me to, to close this out about your ongoing journey and, and how you strive to help people and yourself continue on. Well, there's a couple of things that come up when I listen to your question, the first one is in the teachings I'm absorbing and supposed to um, put out into the world for people, part of the practice is non-striving, aka meeting the moment and, and being with what is. So I think it's a continuous challenge for me and I think for most people, particularly as meditators and true as well as a meditation teacher that sometimes it's important to pause and just say, okay, <laughs> what's going on? Where am I with this? What am I trying to do? Why is my heart beating so fast? So I'm trying to meet that and to reflect and to continuously study 
people who know a lot more than I do and absorbed what works. One of my first guests on the show, Out of the Clouds, is one of my favorite people in the world, Diana Rilov, and she's an amazing yoga teacher who lives in New York City. And she said one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard. Her teacher said to her, get the golden run. So basically take the best out of every single teacher that you will come across, run and make it your own. So I think my journey is that I'm following my instinct. I'm continuously learning. I just have to stop and come down and stop signing up for more courses because there's not <laughs> enough time in the day. And hopefully this will help create my own blend that will correspond to my own heart. And I hope that people will enjoy what it is that I'll have to put out there as a teacher. So I think that's, that's an important piece. As for your metaphor about the house, it's a lovely one. I've never heard that one so well explained, but I know, I don't know if you've read Thich Nhat Hanh before. I have, yes. He's an amazing um, teacher and writer, but in his book, The Art of Communicating, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but he basically says it's hard to meditate at first because it's like coming home, only that you haven't been home for a long time. So it's a bit messy, like <laughs> yes. there's cobwebs and it's, you know, there's dust everywhere and, and it's okay. It's just, you, you need to learn to come home. And I think that's the bit that I enjoy the most about what I've discovered so far in my journey to meditation is that knowing that when I sit or if I choose to lie down, that it feels like a coming home. That's a really beautiful way to state it. And especially the last year when this pandemic, many people live their lives afraid of coming home. They distract themselves. Quarantine and lockdown, for example, has forced many people to literally be in their home, but also to really sit with themselves and sit with their life choices and reassess and reflect. So I think many people are starting to do that groundwork just kind of by default. I know my first meditation class, I sat in a room for like four hours in a yoga studio. It was a beautiful summer day and I was kicking myself because I wanted to be outside and I could not quiet my mind. I was going to the four corners of, of just weirdness and sadness and that stupid thing I said in third grade suddenly was at the forefront of my mind, you know, that, that kind of mental flow that kind of drives you insane. And for me, it's, it's been just about getting into that groove and finding different techniques, like the ones that you've been talking about, that just resonate. Certain styles of yoga don't resonate. My favorite style of yoga is, um, I'm forgetting the name, the one where you just lie down with pillows and blankets. What is that one? Oh, called? restorative. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's blissful. Restorative, I love restorative. yoga. I go mm. into the deepest trances. I'm bugging out in the middle of these yoga studios surrounded by people. And I mean, I'm seeing colors and shapes and and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I've I found the meditation hack because it's like I'm cheating. I'm just I'm lying here on the ground with a cloth covering my eyes. <laughs> covered in blankets um i because I, I feel like isn't meditation supposed to be work and you're putting an energy into it and that is personally what resonates with me but um but i know I, I think i think people listening to this too especially if you're exploring meditation for the first time or you're kind of early on in your journey um I think it's really important to just find what resonates, just like yoga classes, hot yoga. I love it. Baptiste yoga. I love it. Um, the kind of yoga where you have to stay in the pose for a very long time because pain is beauty. Not for me, <laughs> but I know other people that might be their jam. So that's just a little more about my journey. So what has worked for you during the time of the pandemic? If you could pick one practice that because I know we're not out of it yet, despite the vaccine arriving very soon. And um, 
putting myself in the shoes of, of other listeners and, and thinking about needing more support over the, the next few weeks and months, what, what do you think has been the most helpful to you in, in your practice? Yes, that's a great question. So this is what works for me. In the morning, I call it in my mind, my power hour. And it's one hour of my morning where I start when I'm laying in bed and I first open my eyes. I'm kind of in that beautiful dreamlike state where the world isn't quite real yet. And as I'm waking up, I make it a very conscious choice, and it is a choice, to bring positivity into my life. So I've been doing a lot of work with affirmations, things like, I am strong, I am powerful, I am appreciated, I am loving, I am loved. So I start with those, you know, kind of mudras, if you will, that I also use when I meditate. If I'm not sure what to meditate on or focus on, I always turn to mudras first. And and I do that for maybe five, 10 minutes. And then the next thing that I do is I think about maybe two or three things that I want to achieve or things along my journey in life that I want to point myself towards continuously. So whether that's a goal like living on the beach <laughs> with a dog or it's writing a book that takes off. And I put myself in the frame of mind like I've already achieved it. It is done. Those are three words that I say to myself. And so I imagined, wow, uh, a million people bought my book today. And I try to make it not too grandiose where, I mean, that's still grandiose, but I try to make it something where it, it's feasible. Um, and then I make my coffee and I think, wow, I sold a million copies of my book today. And then, and then I go into um, just some really simple tarot readings where I pick a card for the day to focus on. And I don't pick it as in, this is my future for the day. This is what's going to happen. But just this is a reminder of something that I need to focus on. So if I get, the other day, I, kept, I got three cards in a row that said, go out in nature, go for a walk. And I have a lot of aha moments where I realize, wow, I haven't been outside in, in like three days. <laughs> I've been glued to my computer working. Um, and because of daylight savings, I, you know, when I finish work, I look outside and it's dark out and, and it's cold outside. And gosh darn it, I'm gonna put on three coats and go outside and, and go for a walk and, and stay mindful. Um, but that hour in the morning, it sets the entire day and if I don't do that, I notice a big difference. And, hmm. and I, it's, it's so interesting. Like it is, I, like you talked about, you meditate every single day and people watch TV every single day. There are things people do every single day without thinking and why not meditate every single day and make it a practice. And it doesn't have to be this grandiose thing. It can be so simple as, I'm laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, and I'm saying to myself, I am beautiful, I am strong, I am powerful. That can change your life and that can help change the world. Yeah, I, I read recently, I mean, there's various ways to say it, but I read recently, thoughts become things. Be careful to pick the good ones. <laughs> I think it's really important to choose our thoughts as much as we choose where possible the activities that fill our days and by being intentional with how you start your day you literally are altering your body chemistry there was a fascinating interview um on the james altucher show super geeky so lots of uh, <laughs> lots of scientific background explaining why creating a mindful ritual every morning and, and doing x amount of tasks actually helps a number of biochemicals to be released in the body and just sort of flood you with, with positivity because you've achieved um, goals that you've set yourself. So I, I applaud you. Uh, creating a, a morning ritual like this is, is super strong. And I wonder, have you heard of the, the psychologist uh, Marissa Peer? I have not, no. Ooh, you should definitely look her up. 
So she's, I will, um, yes. She's very bossy, I want to say. She's British. I, <laughs> she's love, I love her already. <laughs> she's been <laughs> voted by multiple publications as one of the, the, the best psychologists in, in the UK. And she has several meditation programs on affirmations, particularly for morning. And I don't subscribe or do everything she says, although I do really appreciate the way that she explains how our mind works. And again, it's about, you know, being mindful of our thoughts. So meditation helps us get more self-awareness. And once you realize the content of your thoughts, you can then transition and listen to someone like Marissa and be more directive as to how to tell our minds things that actually help us achieve stuff. Um, let's say that we have some ingrained systems dating back millions of years, no, hundred thousand years. <laughs> That can sort of get in the way. Our limbic brain is, is what I'm referring to. So there's some other really interesting teachers out there that help us get into the action mode after we've gone through the self-awareness mode. Yes, and I, I love going down that rabbit hole, especially with social media. It's really easy to kind of tap into that community. I actually don't spend that much time on it whatsoever. Oh, that's probably for the best. <laughs> what yeah. about you? Do you spend a lot of time on social? No, I, I'm so bad at all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I focus more on creating the content versus promoting it. I kind of think if it's good, people will find it. Um, sure. We, we live in this world where everyone is blasting you with, buy this, do this, this will change your life. Uh, and I don't think the world needs more of that. One of the reasons why I wanted to do a mindfulness podcast is to kind of cut through the noise and... Um, help people get back to basics and not have all of that external static kind of floating around in your mind with all the stimulation with everything. Yeah, I agree with that. I listen, I appreciate the connection that I get through social media, especially since I've lived in so many different places around the world. So, you know, it's useful for sure. Um, but I think at some point it's good to let it go and just focus on real life stuff. Yes, you are more than your hashtags and your tweets and your retweets and all that stuff. <laughs> your your yeah. life is more important. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Maybe I can ask you what I ask on my podcast as a, generally as the last question. Sure. What brings you happiness? Oh, what brings me happiness is simplicity. Sitting outside looking up at the sky with a cup of tea, just feeling connected to everything. That feeling when you look up at the stars, that brings me happiness, knowing that my ancestors and everyone's ancestors have looked up at the sky and wondered, well, what is it up there? What are we all connected to? Um, looking up at little balls of light, some of which may have exploded like, you know, two bazillion light years ago. That fascinates me. You know, I, I went to this planetarium once and they did this exhibit where they talked about the naming of the stars and what they're made up of and how long ago they were created. And it just blew my mind because I'm thinking, wow, we're so insistent as a society, especially a scientific community of labeling everything. And does it really matter what chemical compounds this star is made up of and who named it and what coordinates of the galaxy it exists in? I'm more fascinated with how the heck did it get there in the first place and, and how did we get here? And it sounds bizarre, but that's the contents of my brain and why I started a podcast. But when you look down at your hands and your fingers and your toes, what brings me happiness is thinking about, wow, these parts of my body used to be in the stars and in the galaxies. And, and I don't exactly know how that happened and no one really knows, but what brings me happiness is uh, just keeping that curiosity and that wanderlust at the forefront of everything that you do not being afraid to ask questions. I know you mentioned something that resonated with me that I think we definitely have in common, which is you want to surround yourself 
with people who know more than you. And that takes a lot of boldness. Not everyone wants to do that. Some people, they want to be the big fish in the small ponds. Otherwise, it's scary because you're tapping into that kind of unknown part of yourself. And I'm not afraid to do that. And I think a lot of people in the meditation community, they're unafraid to be vulnerable. They're unafraid to put themselves out there because meditating, that's putting yourself out there in the most vulnerable way possible because you have to sit with your own thoughts and be at peace. And that's a journey that I'm never stopping. There's no end in sight. Um, you keep going and you keep rising above and you keep asking questions and you keep looking up at the stars. Hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That was a long-winded answer of, um, I'm But curious. that was great. <laughs> <laughs> that was lovely. For more about the Enoughism podcast, visit IamEnoughism.com and follow me on social media at IamEnoughism. The Enoughism Podcast is about...